Listen, I just finished a message that you're getting ready to watch called Get Out of Your Own Head. Listen to me, YouTube family. I only make one request for you. I'm going to ask you one more time for my mind. If this bless you, just share it with somebody else. Help them get out of their own head. Enjoy the message. Incredible. Well, listen, I got a word for you today. It's not about the man. It's about the message. And God's got a message for you. I'm ready to jump right into it. I want you to click in your Bible or if you're old school, turn in that Bible or if you don't have either one, just look on the screen. Uh, Numbers chapter number 14, verse number 20 is where we're going to begin this reading, guys. I feel this one. I'm telling you this one. I was as I was as I was preparing this one, it was ministering to me. So check this out. It says, the Lord replied, don't miss this. I've forgiven them just as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, or surely yeah, as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. Somebody open your mouth and say, that's me. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> he said, Caleb, has a different spirit. I love, I love when God call you out by name. So he's got a different spirit. He follows me, not perfectly, but wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. I want to tag a title to this text. I want you to receive this as your own testimony. Here's the subject of today's sermon. I've got to get out of my own head. <laughs> I've got to get out of my head. <laughs> well, family, listen, I want to start this sermon with a statement that you've heard me regularly and repeatedly uh, rehearsing before you. I've been consistently, even chronically, communicating this truth, utilizing this phrase. Here it is for my note takers. How far you go and how much you grow is not just determined by what you believe about God. It is equally impacted by what you believe about you. The scriptures frame it this way in the book of Proverbs. As a man or woman thinks in his heart, so is he. Notice what the writer did not say. He did not say as God thinks in his heart, so is he. He says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he suggesting that we will behave in a way that is consistent with the way we see ourselves, not necessarily the way God sees us. I, I want you to catch this family. I want you to catch this because the statement and the scripture is subliminally suggesting that at times there can be an inconsistency between the way God sees us and the way we see ourselves. And whoever wins the argument in your head regarding the way you view you versus the way God views you dictates and determines what happens with you, in you, through you, and for you. I came to tell somebody, here are my note takers, write this now, your advancement in life is determined by who wins the argument in your head. <laughs> I wish you would talk back to me. New Jer I, I said your advancement in life is determined by who wins the argument in your head. And how do I know you have arguments going on in your head? It's not because I can read your mind. I know you got arguments going on in your head because I read my Bible. 
And the Bible tells me that mental arguments are an expression of spiritual warfare. You cannot be a child of God and not be an object of the attack of the enemy. And one of the ways the enemy attacks us is by placing vain imaginations in our mind that create arguments. Isn't that what Paul said? He, 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 says, he says, come on, we, 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 we exalt Christ and every argument that comes against the knowledge of God. And come on, be honest. There are some arguing going on. I know we argue with other people, but I'm looking for some people that are honest enough to say most of my arguments are with me. Come on, y'all aren't talking back to me today. I said, I'm looking for some people that are honest enough to admit that my arguments are with me because it's the enemy trying to convince you that what God says about you is true. Come on, we can go back to part one in this series where we talked about the law of first mention and you'll see that that's the very thing he tried to do in the garden with Adam and Eve. But if you're dealing with that kind of mental warfare that's telling you what you can't do, what you won't do, what you can't be, what you can't recover from, what you won't have, I got a weapon for you that I can give you and you can use in warfare. I want to know who wants the weapon. I said, if you want the weapon, wave at me. Who wants the weapon? Here's the weapon. The weapon is in the form of words. Here's the words. The devil is a liar. That's your weapon. See, your grandmama knew how to use it. Your grandfather knew how to use it. Your aunt knew how to use it. And I need you to learn how to use that same weapon. I said the devil is a liar. Now, when I say the devil is a liar, I don't mean just he doesn't tell the truth. Come here, Jersey. Come here, Global. I'm saying he can't tell the truth. Did you hear what I just said? I'm not saying he doesn't just tell the truth. I'm saying he can't tell the truth. Hey, come on, the, the Bible says he's a liar and the truth is not even in him. Which means everything he tells me is actually the opposite of what's true. So you should be praising and rejoicing when the enemy starts planting arguments in your head because if he's telling you you're not going to blow up, the truth is you are. If he's telling you you're not going to come out, the truth is you're on your way out. If he's telling you everybody's getting ready to walk away, the truth is the right people are getting ready to come in. And I want somebody in this church service to make a decision that you're getting ready to have a reverse reaction to the words the enemy is putting in your mind. When he says it's over, you're going to start praising. When he says the door's closed, you're going to start giving God glory because he can't tell the truth. And I'm talking to some people that are saying, well, God must be getting ready to bring a whole lot to pass in my life. Because it seemed like in this last season of my life, the devil's been all in my ear. He's talking to me when I wake up, talking to me when I lay down, talking to me when I'm in the car, talking to me through social media. And I want to tell somebody, if he is telling you what you cannot be and what you cannot do, it's because he's got a sneak preview of a coming attraction of what God's trying to do in your life and he knows that it's not enough for God to believe you can do it you got to believe you can do it it's not enough for God to believe you can be it you got to believe you can be it and the fact that the devil is coming so hard at you is an indication that the devil got more faith in you than you do Y'all aren't talking to me. <laughs> I said the fact that the devil is coming at you the way he's coming at you is an indication that he's got more faith in you than you do. I need your faith to at least catch up with the devils. I'm going to say that one more time. <laughs>
I said, I'm going to need your faith to at least catch up uh, with the devils. Because he tries to keep us out of God's best by keeping us in our own heads. In my head about what he's calling me to do. In my head about what hadn't happened yet. In my head about this next season and this next step. And this passage family that we just read, our foundational passage here, is an incredible example of the importance of getting out of our own head. This is Numbers chapter number 14. Let the church say 14. Y'all need to put it in the chat in global. Say 14. Here it is. 14. 14 is after 13. 13 is when they send the spies, come on, over to the promised land to spy it out. 14 reveals the conversation that God has with them after that experience. Y'all not ready, y'all not ready, y'all not ready, y'all not, no, 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 y'all not ready. See, See, I said 13 reveals the experience, 14, reveals God's conversation with them after their refusal to step into what he prepared for them. I'm not going to bother this because I just want to throw it out, but we read it in the first part of the text. God says, because you didn't go in then, you're not going in ever. I'm, I'm not. Did you hear what I, <laughs> see, the, I, y'all come get me today. <laughs> he, he, the Bible says to everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And there are times where God gives you a prompting and a push in a season where a window of opportunity is going to strategically open at the same time he's giving you the push. And sometimes we miss the push because we're in our own head and we're making the assumption that the window is gonna come back around again. It is spiritual procrastination. That's the worst kind of procrastination. That's the most consequential kind of procrastination. Spiritual procrastination is a different kind of procrastination because spiritual procrastination is based on the assumption that God has an obligation to do it again. And God's like, I don't have an obligation to do it the first time. Everything I did, you didn't deserve. Every door I opened, you didn't deserve. Every way I made, you didn't deserve. And you want me to do it again? But let me rob the enemy of the instrument of condemnation. Because some of you right now are saying, Dr. Darius, I missed some windows. I missed some opportunities. And that enemy's got you all in your head. I also want to remind you that although he's the God of the push and strategic timing, he is also the God based on his sovereignty that will run it back. (laughs) Did you hear what I just said? He's a God that once you learn the lesson will say now you're ready for the blessing. I'm going to run this back. And I don't know who I'm talking to but I need all the perfect people in church today to be quiet. I need all the people who made the right decisions be quiet. But for anybody that's messed up, that's missed some doors and missed some seasons, open your mouth and say, run it back, run it back, run it back. If you run it back, I'm walking through the door. If you run it back, I'm going to manage it wisely. I need you to run it, run it back. I need you to run it back. The story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 is a story that reveals how he runs it back. <laughs> because the younger son said give me my inheritance what you got in the wheel for me give it to me watch this he was saying give me when he was immature but when he was in the pig pen and he grew up a little bit he said I'm going to go back home and say make me when you're spiritually immature you say give me but when you grow up You say, make me, because if you make me, you don't have to give me. If you make me, I'll go get it myself. Who who am I preaching to today? 
I said, if you make me, I'll go and get it myself. This is interesting, family. This, this is interesting. This story here, Numbers 14, is so powerful. We typically stop at 13. But 14 is so powerful because this is, this is so, so interesting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so interesting because if you're familiar contextually with what happened in 13, they did not occupy this place called Canaan because they in their head. They, 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 they couldn't get, they couldn't get, they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't get over them. This, this is so interesting. It's so interesting because when you understand this narrative, we picked up, we, we, we're picking up in Numbers, but it begins in Exodus. So Numbers is a continuation of what happens in Exodus, okay? So, so in Exodus, God, whenever he's having a conversation with Israel about getting out of Egypt, he always tells them, I'm bringing you out to bring you in. When every time. So the conversation is never, I'm just going to bring you out of an old thing. I'm not going to bother this. But I'm going to touch it just a little bit. And don't, don't, don't get mad at me now. Don't get mad. Somebody talk back to your pastor and say, I ain't mad at you. Say it. Come on, you didn't say, I'm looking at you in the back, and you didn't, you, I said, come on, in the back, I want, come on, say, say, I ain't mad at you. Uh, okay, li- listen, listen to me, listen to me now, listen to me now. When you assume God's goal is just deliverance, you are settling for less than God's best for the believer. God said, I, I just, I want to do more than get you out of Egypt. He said, that's all you want is just, just to be delivered? <laughs> and, and there are people forming entire theologies and building whole Christian communities just around deliverance. And God's like, that's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. He said, I, I, I didn't bring you out of Egypt just to bring you out. He said, he said, I'm bringing you out to take you in. I'm bringing you out to take you in. I'm bringing you out to take you into a land that flows with milk and honey. This is where they got in their head. I think they were clear on what God intended to do. I think they got in their head <laughs> on how God was going to do it. They, they, they were clear on where they were supposed to go. But this is just like God. Talk to them about the where. Says nothing about the way. He says nothing about the way. But this is what the text says. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 says this. I want y'all to see this because I know many of you may be familiar with Some of you may not be, and that's fine. And that, that, that might be an advantage of that. You don't have to do any religious deprogramming. But, so if, if you're not, not familiar with these stories, I don't want you to ever feel like you're at a disadvantage, right? So, so God, God's kindness, God's timing, he's, you're right where you need to be. But check this out. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through Philistine country though that was shorter. Come on. Come on. Come on. Somebody just got free right there. See, watch this. He says, that was a shorter way. But shorter, not always better. Come on. For God said, if they face war, they weren't ready for the Philistines yet. God knows what battles you're not ready for. He says if they face war, they might change their mind and return to Egypt. Somebody say amen to me today. God knows what battles will cause you to backslide. And some of you, come on, and some of us rather, if we honestly audit our life, God knew how to perfectly position you for the trial you currently facing. Because if you were facing six years ago, the same trial you're facing right now, you would have went back to Egypt. Come on. But God knows <laughs> the right way to get you there. 
This is it. The Bible says he takes them on this desert road. So God led them around by the desert toward the Red Sea. And the Israelites went out of Egypt ready for battle. He led them around by the desert toward the Red Sea. This, this what some translations call a desert, a lot of translations call a wilderness. It's, it's wilderness. And contextually, we know it wasn't like woods. We know contextually, just the ge- geographical location, it was more deserty, but it was called a wilderness because it was undeveloped. Egypt was bondage, but it was developed. It was, it was bondage, but I knew where my next meal was coming from. <laughs> it, it, it was bondage, so it was comfortable and uncomfortable at the same time. It was, it was, <laughs> it was the, the wilderness. Now, it, it was, this wilderness is, was supposed to be a transitional season. Yeah. Remember, because they're on their way to Canaan, yes. right? So, now watch this. They had to experience the wilderness way, but they did not have to have wilderness wandering. I want you to catch this now. God said, I got to take you this way. Even though it's longer, I got to take you this way. So I take you here. You determine how long you stay though. Did you hear what I just said? I, 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 I said, God said, I got to take you this way. But you determine how long you stay. I need somebody I, no, 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 no. Y'all miss what I just said. I said, I need somebody to make a decision. I'm tired of this. No, no, no. Because the wilderness season is a season that is easy to settle in. It's a deceptive season because it's better than the previous one. Ah. Did you hear what I... Yeah, most people settle in the wilderness because it's better than Egypt. You're not in Egypt, but you're not in Canaan. You're not where you're going, but you're not where you were. Things are not as good as they could be, but not as bad as they used to be. But they were so bad when they were bad, whenever you get anything better than bad, you call it good. And you you stay there. Don't, don't miss it. Don't, don't miss it. it. It's supposed to be, you've heard me say this. You've heard me say this. It's supposed to be a stage, not a state. This is why, come on. If, 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 if you've been in Sunday school, wave at me right here. I know y'all in the back. I know right here on this side in the back. I know y'all. That's all my mothers and uh, my golden girls, y'all over. I know y'all, come on now. We was in Sunday school. I used to teach some of you Sunday school when I was an intern at Princeton. So wave at me. All right, li- li- listen to me now. Listen to me. Don't, 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 <laughs> don't, don't miss this. Uh, s- some of you, some of you go back to your Sunday school days and think about this wilderness season and how they ended up being there 40 years. Now, I don't know where I am like with numerology, so I'm not a numerologist, but numbers do mean something in the Bible. Does that make sense? When when you see them over and over and over and the number 40 seems to always be associated with seasons. Like representing a season. Come on, Sunday school. Wave at me one more time, Sunday school. With the flood and with Noah. 
40 days, 40 nights. When Jesus, before he began his public ministry, was led in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, 40 days. Israel ends up wandering in the wilderness 40 years. Because 40 kind of represents seasons. Got me? Okay. In our head, it would seem like, man, this, se- this season or this, this wilderness season is negative. And God's like, no, nah, it's necessary. No, 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 it's negative, necessary, negative, necessary. Because like, it's only negative when you stay there past the time I've allotted for you. He said, he said it's necessary because it is a place that I use in your present to prepare you for the place that I am taking you in your future. Don't miss this. The wilderness season is a season God sets you in every time he's getting ready to move you to the next chapter of his story for your life. There is no elevation without wilderness seasons because the wilderness season is the season that gives you preparation for the elevation. Don't miss this. It's a place of preparation because there's something that happens in the wilderness that doesn't happen in in any other space in your life. And it's something called purging. (laughs) Here it is, purging. Come on now. Now all y'all that grew up Pentecostal should have quickened to something right there. You should have bow and arrow, come on. You should have did the ugly face or something right there. I said purging. Watch this. What's purging, Darius? Purging is abrupt or violent removal of something. God said, I'm going to move this abruptly. I'm going to remove this quickly. I'm going to remove this expeditiously. Don't miss this. It's, 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 It's a place of purging. And I see that it's purging for Israel. I see it was a place of purging for them with their, with their, they got purged of some issues. Because they was out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. Did you hear what I just said? They were out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. Dr. Darius, how do you know that? Because when Moses went to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, they built a golden calf. How you, where'd you learn how to do that? You learned how to do that in Egypt. But you were out of it, but you... T- and God's like... Where I'm getting ready to take you, calves can't go no more. I I let you get out of Egypt into the wilderness with the calf, but you can't go from the wilderness to Canaan with the calf. I don't know what your calf is, but all of us got some things that we've constructed, that we depend on, that we lean on. God say, all right now, we're going as far as we can go with that. That baggage don't fit on this plane. <laughs> that baggage doesn't fit on this plane. Purging of issues. People don't like, they never like when I get this one. Uh, purging of individuals. That's purging. Abrupt removal. Sometimes it's so abrupt, you're confused. You're like, what happened to our relationship? God like me. This is what's scary. This is what makes this so difficult for people. And Moses failed at this. He failed at this. Because God, in some instances, when God pulls them out, you have the power to bring them back in. Yeah. God had conversation with Moses saying, Moses, these people don't want it. He said, so what I need to do is I need to raise up another generation that actually want this. What Moses does, I'm not going to bother this because this, this, this is a completely different sermon. Moses 
goes into prayer and starts interceding for the preservation of those people. And I'm not going to bother it, but we, we treat that as an act of spirituality when it was an expression of codependency. Because God actually tells Moses, he said, because you prayed, I'm going to keep them around, but they will not go in. So he says, I'm going to grant your request and give you what you want, even though I know this is not what you need. And that's why when Moses hit the rock, instead of speaking to the rock, God said, now I got to move you. Because I tried to move them and you wouldn't let me. And the reason I tried to move them is because I knew down the line they were going to have this effect on you. But when I tried to remove them in the past season, they hadn't done anything that was bad enough that made sense to you as to why they needed to be removed. He said, but Moses, sometimes I try to remove them proactively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God said, I, I want to remove them before you have to know why they needed to be moved. Because sometimes when you know why they needed to be moved, they've already caused some damage to your destiny. He said, do you always have to have a knife in your back before you realize that's a bad relationship? He says, can we get some people out of there before they stab you? Somebody open your mouth and just say, ouch, 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 uh, pur purging, purging the issues, purging the individuals, guys, purging the attitudes. Guys, see, you got Exodus, which goes into numbers, right? And you got numbers that goes into, um, where am I? Deuteronomy, yes, Deuteronomy, which is the... Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So you got uh, Leviticus, which is, they're, they're in the wilderness, which is the, iter the first iteration of the law. So Exodus, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And Leviticus is when God lays down the law, right? So you got 613 commandments, right? Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy now is the second Iteration. It is the reiteration of the law to another generation. So this is why you'll see some of the same things in Deuteronomy that are in Leviticus. If I'm making sense, wave at me. Wave at me. Now I done told y'all in the back that I need y'all to wave. I'm saying, wave at me. Okay. So don't miss this, family. Don't don't miss this. 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 So Deuteronomy though is written while they still in the wilderness. But Deuteronomy is not a repeat of Leviticus. It's an iteration of it, but it's an expansion of it because it is also a book that prepares them for Canaan. So they in the wilderness, but in Deuteronomy, he talking to them about Canaan. Watch what he says in Deuteronomy 8. And when you get into the land that I'm taking you, that's Deuteronomy 8, right? When you get houses you didn't build. Vineyards you didn't plant. Wells you did not dig. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gave you the power to get wealth. So he's talking to them about how to handle themselves at the next level when they're still at the same level. <clears throat> He's talking, <laughs> he is talking to them about how to handle Canaan before they get in it. He said, when you get wells, you didn't dig, houses, you didn't build, vineyards, you didn't plant. Don't forget me. Because God's like, I got to deal, deal with your attitude because I got to get your head in Canaan before your life get there. Because I can't get you into Canaan until I get you out of your head. <laughs> And some of you are confused right now because some of the conversations God's having with you don't make sense because the conversations don't match your situation. And God's like, what I'm trying to do is get your head out. I'm talking. Come here, New Jersey. He said, I'm trying to get your head out. And so I'm talking to you about stuff you don't have. I'm talking to you about stuff you haven't done. I'm preparing you for something that doesn't even make sense because I'm having a conversation about Canaan while you're in the wilderness.
Are y'all all right? <laughs> he said, you need, he said, every time I get ready to elevate you, I got to set you in a season where I deal with these things. Issues, individuals, attitudes. Now you're ready. Issues, individuals, attitudes. Now you're ready. Issues, individuals, attitudes. Now you're ready. So when you're experiencing correction, your correction should lead to enthusiasm and not condemnation because correction is always preparation. If he's not correcting anything, he's not preparing me for anything. So I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to let God do what he does during this purging season. But Israel, I'm done, could not get out of their own head. They go through all of this and God situates them right on the edge of the thing they've been praying for, promised, prophesied about, and, 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 and they say, we can't because they giants and we grasshoppers. They didn't lose to the giant out there. They lost to the grasshopper in here. Watch this. Because the grasshopper determines if you try or how you try. Mm, see, <laughs> yeah, see, I said the grasshopper mentality, come on, determines if you try or how you try. For some for some people, it stops them from trying. For other people, it affects the way they try. They don't try with confidence. They don't try with enthusiasm. They don't try. But I want somebody to look at me right now. I want you to square your shoulders. I want you to get a stank face. I want you to get an attitude. And I want you to prepare your mind to step into the greatest season of your life. Because this battle you're fighting is not with the giant out there. This battle you're fighting is with the grasshopper in here. They couldn't get out of their own head. They were using I'm not language when God uses I am. <laughs> don't, 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 don't miss this, guys. They, they mismanaged that, that wilderness season because they couldn't get out of their own heads. God's like, once I deal with the issues, once I deal with the individuals, once I deal with the attitude, I'm ready. I need you to take the leap. So God's like, you ready, but you don't take possession because you don't believe you're ready. So they stay stuck. Let's make a loop. Let's go back to the beginning. Homiletical loop. Let's go back to the beginning. They stay stuck. Not because of what God believed about them. They stay stuck because of what they believed about themselves. And that belief system impacted the way that they managed that wilderness season. That wilderness season, you got to manage that season. You can't control it, so you got to manage it. What do you manage? First of all, you, you got to manage your makeup in that season. You, you got to know you. Moses mismanaged his makeup. Bro, you shouldn't have been surprised that you hit that rock because you broke those tablets of stone. You thought that was no longer in you because the glory is on you. But your anointing is not your healing, Moses. You ain't under. <laughs> you don't understand your makeup. You're confusing your anointing with your healing. You can split red seas and still break a tablet. Because it's in you. So you got to understand your makeup. So man, I got a man. I know my makeup. What I love about David. David knew his makeup. He made some mistakes. That, well, I tell you, that man knew his makeup. He knew his makeup. That man wrote down, he was writing the Psalms. He said, it was good that I was afflicted. <laughs> it was good that I was afflicted. That I, he said, because that's God. That's about the only way you're going to get my attention. I know me. I got a man in these seasons. I got to know my makeup. I was like, man, if you got a tendency to, 
to speak negatively. If you got a tendency to to go real real low and get sad real fast if, if you got a tendency to, to to engage in escapist behaviors you got tendency to be people please like whatever it is you, you got to understand your makeup because if you don't know your makeup when God's dealing with you with issues and when he's dealing with you with individuals you're gonna mismanage that if you know like I, I overcommit I got a tendency to bring people back in that God pulls out you got to know your makeup because really am I making sense guys because the first thing I got to manage in that wilderness season is me. But it's not just that. I got I to gotta manage the manna. And I don't have time to break down what all that was in the scriptures, guys. But the manna represents three things. It represents when God's performance doesn't match your expectation. Because Israel's in the wilderness. They hungry because it's not developed. So it's no fields. It's no grain. It's not developed. So how do they get food? It's no garden. Got me? So how do they eat? Like, God, we need something to eat. We want some bread. They're like, you want some bread? God's like, okay. So he sends something like in the form of this seed. It's like this frosty-like substance, and it's on the ground in the middle of the, every morning. And, and they're like, wait a minute now. He says, now, God, you told me I was, I was going to receive some bread. This is not bread. But sometimes God grants the request in a way that's so different than what you expected you don't recognize he's granted the request. God said, my performance didn't match. He said, I did what you asked. I just, <laughs> it just looks like something that's completely different. I'm not going to bother this, but just a little bit. What, what they had to do was they had to take that coranda seed and they had to grind it. And when they grinded it, it became like grain and they could use it to make bread. So God gave them provision in the form of a project. He said, I'm going to answer your prayer, but you got to grind. <laughs> There's some work you have to do to create bread. I'm, giving, I'm not going to give you the bread, but I'm going to give you the thing that, that, that you can use to create bread. And sometimes God's going to give it to you in that form. And you, you, you got to manage that and here's here it is this this is chapter this is chapter 14 I love it third thing they didn't manage is they didn't manage if we have to manage it was the miracles listen to God's critique he says they saw my glory they saw the signs I performed in Egypt they saw the miracles I worked in the wilderness saying they still not convinced the purpose of miracles is not just to answer a problem the purpose of miracles is also to send you a message <laughs> God's not just trying to fix that problem he's also trying to fix something you believe about him he says I did that so that you can leave with a message that I can do that He says, I did it so that you could know I could do it. And so when you move into the future and you face future difficulties, you should face those future difficulties being fueled by the faith from what you've seen in your past that he can do that. And this is scary. And God says to them, he says, listen, I don't know what else I can do to convince you. I'm done, but I want you to look back over your life. Come on, Jersey, look back over your life. Come on, Global, look back over your life. I think at this point in your life, doubt is illogical. Not faith is illogical. At this point in your life, doubt is illogical. All the evidence, the preponderance of evidence, it points to the fact that he can do it. This is your time to get out of your own head. I'm going to tell you what I started to call this. Trying to be big when little got you. And for some of us, we're talking about being delivered from lust and from lying and lasciviousness. Some of us need to be delivered from little. That grasshopper mentality. It's got you believing you can't do 
what he's called you to do. And you can't be what he's called you to be. And I'm praying that God's going to help you get out of your own head. Right now, to the, just to the level that you're comfortable. Right there. Come on, in person, in church, just to the level that you're comfortable. Just lift those hands. That's the receiving position. This is not magic, but the Bible says this is an expression of worship. And we believe everything that the Bible says about everything. It says that when you lift your hands, you lift your heart. That's lamentations. You lift your hands. You're lifting your hearts. Father, I pray right. I pray a prayer right now of deliverance. Oh, I know that deliverance is not an end into itself. It's a means to an end. You want to bring us out so you can take us in. But I pray that you deliver us from little. Lord, we're not just praying for deliverance from the giants we're facing. We're praying for deliverance from the grasshopper that's in our head. Pray for deliverance from little. And in this season, I pray right now as their hands are lifted, I pray, just like you did for the Apostle Paul, I pray that you do it for, for these people right now. They're part of change. I pray for an impartation of the spiritual gift of faith right now. As their hands are lifted, Father, I pray right now that the spiritual gift of faith, this uncommon, unteachable ability to believe you, I pray that that spiritual gift, you impart spiritual gifts. You told Timothy, stir up the gift of God that was given to you by the laying on of hands of the presbyter. I pray for an impartation of that gift. Somebody's in a season where they got to believe. And they can't even believe you without your help. We pray like the parents of the boy with, with seizures. Father, I believe. But help my unbelief. So I thank you right now. That gift is being, in, oh, glory to God that that gift is being imparted. I even thank you right now, Father, that, 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 that the gift of prophetic insight, I sense that, that, that you're giving people eagle eyes. My God, to see differently now. They're going to see not just their future differently. They're going to see their present differently. I thank you for prophetic insight now. A spiritual sixth sense that you're just releasing unto your people. God, we give you praise for that right now that your people are leaving differently. In Jesus' name, we, we just receive those gifts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Clap your hands in this room. Clap them in Atlanta. Clap them in New Jersey. Clap them online. Father, we love you. We love you. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right. If this message bless you, do me a favor share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.